put us into um so yeah thank you very much for coming this evening guys um just want to say before i get going this is actually based on two of the chapters from my master's dissertation <coughs> um so there are certain aspects to this that i've admittedly done limited research on just because I didn't have the word space really to go into it in my master's dissertation um, and that's mainly the specifically asexual stuff um, but I'm really hoping I'm starting my PhD touch wood everything goes well <laughs> in September um, and I'm really hoping to really get into investigating the, the status I guess of asexuality at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries so really this talk primarily talks about non-sexuality sort of alongside asexuality which is subtle but still importantly different so the idea of queerness then in the 19th century um, as well as in the works of apparently displaced victorian writer mr james is not a new one and it's not an unknown one either um to date there has been a notably psychoanalytical slant to any of the criticism given to James, um, especially regarding attempts to read repressed or oppressed sexuality within his work. So what I'm hoping to do in the next 40 minutes or so is to expand what we understand by queerness and hopefully to show that it's, it's more fruitful to explore MR James and the ghosts he writes about through a non-sexual or asexual lens um, in order to think about how his work is queer in a different sense. So what I'm going to first do is map out a bit of a contextual framework to think about queerness um, and a little bit about its etymological roots um, in order to create a sort of working definition as well as um, then I will investigate what the 19th century reader might have understood or expected a ghost to mean. Um, and then we're going to finish off with looking at a number of James's stories um, in more detail. And we're going to be looking specifically at A Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, The Diary of Mr. Pointer and Karen Alber Canon Alberic's scrapbook to demonstrate the ways in which his ghosts are queered in comparison to the 19th century norm. So... First, um, it's going to be useful, isn't it, to think about what I mean when I say queer during this talk. And perhaps predictably, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick is a real key starting point for my work in defining queerness, um, especially with her concept of homosocial desire, which I will go into later. But I'm going to start with um, Haggerty's Queer Gothic and Smith and Hughes's Queer in the Gothic, um, because they both also outline a sort of historical base for the queer within the Gothic. Um, Haggerty notes that the Gothic offers a historical mode of queer theory and politics. It's transgressive, sexually coded and resistant to dominant ideology. Um, and Hughes and Smith have also written similarly that the Gothic has been characteristically perceived in criticism as being poised astride the uneasy cultural boundary that separates the acceptable and familiar from the troubling and different. Haggerty Hughes and Smith's idea of difference then links back to the linguistic origins of the term queer itself. Um, Noreen Giffney has actually written about this in the introduction to the Ashgate Research Companion to Queer Theory, where she suggests that the word was originally adopted to mark the appearance of someone or something odd or strange, and that it was later exercised as a slur predominantly for gay men. Um, and Sarah Ahmed has also put forth the suggestion that the etymological root of the word is the Indo-European word for twist, and then further argues that queer is therefore a spatial term, which then gets translated into a sexual term, uh, being a term for a twisted sexuality that does not follow a straight line. So this idea of something being twisted, um, of going against the norm and the non-normativity of following this straight line also supports the double meaning of queer as both an expression of sexuality, as well as being purely representative of difference. So if we go a bit further and look at the official definition given for queer by the Oxford English Dictionary, the pejorative double nature of the term becomes a lot clearer. So this is 
a, a specifically a screenshot from the OED website. Um, and as a noun, it's defined by the OED as frequently derogatory and referring to a homosexual, especially a homosexual man. And I quite liked the sort of timeline, I guess, of usage. Um, it's quite interesting to see quotes where it's being used. Um, it also explains, however, that it's been used as a neutral or positive term since the late 1980s. The dictionary then offers us a dual definition of queer when used as an adjective. So here, definition given is strange, odd, peculiar, eccentric, also of questionable character, suspicious, dubious. Um, an alternative definition is also given where it refers to a person, homosexual, frequently derogatory and offensive. Interestingly, it also suggests that it refers to a sexual or gender identity that does not correspond to established ideas of sexuality and gender, especially heterosexual norms. So this last definition especially refers back to the ideas of non-normativity. In other words, the suggestion is that to be queer is to work against what is heteronormative. Given this, I'd like to offer the following definition of the term when I use it throughout the rest of this talk. So queer will primarily indicate here non-normativity or difference, thus expanding the term beyond our contemporarily understood sexual sense of the word. Archimedes' argument that queer becomes an umbrella term for all non-straight and non-normative sexualities can, I believe, be taken further to also encompass non- or asexual non-normativity more generally. And the main way in James's work can be read as queer, I want to suggest, is in his representation of ghosts. They're often solid and really hairy or just monstrous and abhuman in appearance and in nature. This expanded and primarily non-sexual definition of queerness has kind of been put forth in different ways by critics, including Giffney, Haggerty and Ahmed, but also William B. Turner and Paulina Palmer. Um, and this quote by William B. Turner is, I think, really important for my expansion of the definition, because uh, he asserts that it, it indicates merely the failure to put precisely within a category, which I think is exactly what I'm trying to express here. Um, but Paulina Palmer has spoken in reference to the ghost specifically um, by writing that the ghost in inhabiting both spiritual and material dimensions also carries associations of ambiguity and contradiction, which are attributes that help to explain its prominence in queer theory. Haggerty also, in his assertion that Gothic fiction is about reaching into some undefinable world beyond fictional reality, and that is why Gothic fiction remains as queer as it is, he shows how queerness can work as the definition that goes beyond the sexual and instead describes non-normativity more generally. So this is the first part where we're going to go back and think about Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, um, especially her essay collection Tendencies. Uh, within Tendencies, we begin to see an expansion of the idea of the non-categorizable, fluid non-normativity of queerness. Um, importantly, Sedgwick introduces us to a concept of simultaneously constitutive and fracturing nature of queer identity. Um, before I want to go on more, I do want to point out that Sedgwick does acknowledge, and there is, the often controversial and tense linguistic history of the term queer. Um, I've previously explored it a little bit on the linguistic side. Um, and she observes that for anyone to disavow the same sex connotations of the term or to displace them from the term's definitional center would be to dematerialize any possibility of queerness itself. Paulina Palmer discusses the ambiguity of the term queer um, and how it's often employed in academia <clears throat> in relation to queer theory to challenge the concept of a stable sexual identification and to problematize the binary division, often in order to delineate between hetero and homosexual, um, yet also often used as a shorthand to encompass the categories of lesbian, gay, and on occasion trans. Um, Palmer also notes 
the uncomfortable way in which many of the LGBTQ plus community, which actually includes her, have received the term queerness. Um, and she explains that while certain features of the queer agenda, such as its representation of sexuality as diverse and mobile, and its deconstruction of the binary are welcome, other aspects are seen as problematic and retrograde. She further criticizes the lack of specificity, excessive utopianism and resultant political ineffectiveness of queer as a terminology. In acknowledging this, however, Cedric is also careful to stress that a lot of the most exciting what recent work around queer spins the term outward along dimensions that can't be subsumed under gender and sexuality. <clears throat> this is obviously a crucial concept for my research um, and is further underpinned when Cedric further highlights that different queer discourses crisscrossing with other identity constituting identity fracturing discourses. As I hope to show, it is this fluidity and this amorphous nature of identity within James's work that constitutes the main element of its queerness, combined or centred around a consideration of the different queer and non-normative representation he makes of the ghost. So I'm not completely disavowing or rejecting the sexual definition and sexual meaning behind the term queer. I'm instead trying to um, expand it and I guess widen its definition to also encompass this other uh, meaning that it has had since its inception in the English language. So now we've thought about queerness in more general, let's think about the ghost. <clears throat> so in his book, The Ghost Story, 1840 to 1920, Andrew Smith makes the link between the representation of the ghost in the literature of the 19th century and their history within English culture. Um, and this helpfully contextualizes, he argues, the sharp rise in popularity of the ghost story during the 19th and early 20th century. The middle of the 19th century in particular saw an unprecedented rise in popularity of spiritualism in the West. Um, and lots of organizations were established that looked into the concept of ghostly hauntings and manifestations. Similarly, and I think really importantly, technology was advancing really quite rapidly during this time. Like, I think we are so used to almost a new piece of technology coming out almost every day in the 21st century that we forget how fast it must have seemed for those in the 19th century as different advances were made. Um, and this kind of meant that the idea that there was a spirit world or a spirit itself communicating with the living, much more of a reasonable thing for them to accept. Um, and Marina Warner notes actually that the year 1851 saw more than 50 companies set up in order to send messages down the wire by the magnetic telegraph that was painted by Morse. And this was almost at exactly the same time when spiritualists were gaining more and more believers. Another really crucial technological advancement of the mid 19th century was in the art of photography, <clears throat> which would have allowed the hunt to capture the ghost on film to really take off and would have allowed people to try and find evidence of this spirit world. Um, so it meant that to the 19th century public mind in general, the presence of this spirit world alongside the everyday one that could kind of move back and forth between them would be a very real and concrete concept. Simone Natale has also argued for a broader cultural turn happening during this period placing ghosts and other supernatural phenomena at the center of the fictional, the spectacular and the religious imagination. So all of this works together, I would like to suggest, to establish a really fixed and definite concept of the ghostly, which seems in direct opposition to many of the ghosts we find within James. <clears throat> According then, to Victorian ideals and understanding, there were two main features that a ghost should have. So firstly, they should have some form of message or a lesson or a prophecy of doom to bring to the living. And secondly, this was especially thanks to the influence of spiritualism, a ghost should absolutely resemble the person they had been while they were living. Um, in Marina Warner's words, it would be essential for a ghost purposes that the person he or she once was should be recognized by the living in order to fulfill these necessary qualities. 
after all, if you're seeking a message from a deceased parent or you're trying to summon them to get their advice, you kind of need to be able to recognize that it is them when they materialize in front of you and in order to foretell your doom or give you a warning. Um, if you can't recognize them, then you're not going to pay attention to the message they bring. You're not going to know it's them. Um, and we can see examples of these kind of spirits in much of the 19th century um, literature and ghost fiction, such as within Jean Lorraine's The Spectral Hand, where the spectre seeks to teach the living a lesson after being summoned at a dinner party, and Margaret Oliphant's The Open Door, in which the ghostly apparitions lead to the uncovering of a secret. In comparison, the spirits we find within the works of M.R. James are evidently non-human or at best, monstrably abnormal or abhuman. And I think this is obvious from the very first read of any M.R. James story, you kind of get the impression that he's not writing about your typical ghost. Um, and S.T. Joshi has observed that the Jamesian ghost seems remarkably material and that there are actually relatively few tales in which it retains the nebulosity of the traditional spectre. And it's this materiality, the sheer solidness of the ghosts that most powerfully differentiates his ghosts from the others appearing in the literature at his time and just before. Um, <clears throat> along with being recognisably human and imparting some form of message, the 19th century ghost was usually expected to be immaterial, probably translucent at most, and barely more than a wisp of a spirit. Even in contemporary examples, ghosts that aren't necessarily familiar or even human in shape are still purely spiritual and non-physical manifestations. So in Green Tea, for example, Sheridan Lefanu depicts a strange simian shaped spectre that haunts and eventually drives its victim to suicide. But this all happens through psychological trauma and torment. There's no actual physical manifestation of violence. Um, I can think of actually one example of a ghost that is a solid figure, um, and that's in L.P. Hartley's The Cotillon, which is a very Poe-like story of a woman who finds herself dancing with her strangely cold bow that she had abandoned. Um, and she eventually learns that this bow that she's dancing with had actually committed suicide before the dance had even started. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. But this ghost, unlike the ghost we find within James, is a tragic figure who in a suitably Victorian manner has come to teach his unfaithful lover a lesson. And he's also really reminiscent of the man he was whilst living. He's clearly recognisable as who he was. He's not monstrous in his appearance or his manner. And this clearly differentiates him from the creatures written about by James. So... Let's look a little bit more closely at James in particular then. As I mentioned at the start of this talk, M.R. James has been treated by critics fairly frequently over the last decade, um, and I would guess three or four decades in particular, um, and he's often placed on a pedestal as being the ghost story writer from the early uh, late 19th and early 20th century. But a lot of this criticism is in uh, concerned with investigating his personal biography um, in order to justify the claim that his work is full of repressed homosexual desire and thus James must have been a closeted gay man, which mostly happens through the application of psychoanalytical theory. But I think this is a really unfair avenue of investigation, um, if not only because it potentially risks asexual erasure. Why, if we look at the biography of a historic writer and we find that they've been an eternal bachelor or exclusively had male friends or whatever it is, why does that instantly mean that they must have had issues coming to terms with their own sexuality or they must have been unable to um, act upon their own sexual desires because of the society they lived in? Why do we not think that they might have just had no sexual desires. They, they might have had asexual desires. Um, but I've already admitted that this line of inquiry specifically is outside of the current remit of this research. But 
I am hoping to undertake further research into asexuality in the late 19th century, um, hopefully to answer some more of these questions. So who knows, this time next year, I might be able to answer some more of these questions and talk a little bit more about this asexual um, line of inquiry. <clears throat> so what instead I hope to do right now is to trace the queer elements of James's stories through his representation of ghosts and spectres, moving beyond sexual readings of characters and to focus on the opposition at play between his conservative men and the fractured, eerie nature of the ghosts that haunt them. So to kind of explain a bit more about why I've decided to move away from psychoanalytical concepts such as the return of the repressed, um, the most common argument in favour of these ideas suggests that it's both the abject form of the ghosts and the search for knowledge that appears within his narrative that therefore must indicate an avoidance of sexual desire. David Punter has written in his seminal Gothic textbook, The Literature of Terror, that if the only motivation of most of James's characters is curiosity, then behind all curiosity, according to Freud, lies the displaced sexual urge. And James's characters do move in an exclusively bachelor world. This, um, the idea that his protagonists are bachelors and therefore that is a justification for a Freudian reading is, I think, both simplistic and generalization. Um, it's certainly not true that when we read a story that has a lack of sex, this needs to mean anything other than we're reading a non-sexual or asexual narrative. Because um, once we take the added layer of Freud away, then the Jamesian ghost story simply becomes a strange ghost story that deviates from other contemporary works that feature single academic men encountering strange spirits during their search for hidden knowledge. Um, or to put it another way, the desire for knowledge shown by James's protagonist is literally just a desire for knowledge for the sake of knowing the unknown. It's not a proxy for sexual desire. It's a total replacement for it. And I think that's a lot more interesting. Um, and I think that's also in some ways at the core of the Jamesian ghost story because he's writing characters that visit libraries and go on golfing holidays simply just to do that without any other hidden or esoteric sexual meaning. And Sedgwick again has supported the idea of the importance of recognizing these non-sexual readings of male characters and relationships within literature, where she writes, the erotic and individualistic bias of literature itself and the relative ease of using feminist theoretical paradigms to write about eros and sex has led to a relative de-emphasis of the many crucially important male homosocial bonds that are less glamorous to talk about such as the institutional, the bureaucratic, and the military. So when we redirect readings of James away from issues of sex, this therefore allows us to examine the identities of his characters and the manifested identities of his ghosts through other lenses in order to trace the true queerness that is inherent within his work. So we're gonna talk about his actual stories now um, and before I talk about and analyse each of them, I will offer a brief summary of the plot in case you haven't read any of these. So I guess it goes without saying that there's going to be spoilers. But at the same time, I really encourage you to read these stories, any and all of them, um, because I, I do find them quite affecting. So first story, I whistle and I'll come to you, my lad. The Cambridge professor Parkins has somewhat reluctantly taken a golfing holiday on the Suffolk coast with colleagues. Preferring to spend his holiday time alone, Parkins takes a walk along the shore to investigate some Templar ruins on behalf of a fellow academic back in college. Here, he uncovers an antique whistle, which he later finds inscribed with quis es iste qui venit on one side and fla for bis fle in a cross configuration on the other. Parkins correctly recognizes this first phrase as biblical and translates it as who is this who is coming. The second phrase when arranged correctly as fur flabis flabis means thief if you blow you will weep. Underturned, Parkins blows the whistle and is promptly and in a typically Jamesian style 
gradually and increasingly more menacingly haunted by a shrouded figure, eventually reaching the climactic and iconic encounter whereby Parkins is attacked by a ghost in robes in a bedsheet. <clears throat> Mike Pinkham has suggested that within O Whistle, James is representing the protagonist, Parkins, throughout the story as being somewhat unmanly in the terms of the collegiate style of life which James would have cherished and experienced. Um, and he suggests that it is Parkins' non-normative identity which is at the core of his characterization. Whilst the initial description of Parkins as being young, neat and precise in speech is not particularly effeminate in itself, the narrator later admits that they have tried to give the impression that Parkins was something of an old woman, rather hen-like perhaps. And this does seem to support Pinkham's idea of Parkins uh, as being unmanly and othered. And there is some evidence that a single man who was unmanly or effeminate would have been othered or queered in a non-normative sense by society in the 19th century. Um, and this is supported by Sean Brady, who has questioned whether men in the late 19th or early 20th century Britain would have perceived that anything other than one form of masculinity offered them the social status of a fully masculine adult man, which, of course, is namely the masculinity of a married father of children. However, society did also view homosocial relationships between men as important, and James's bachelor and seemingly exclusively male relationships did not necessarily instantly signal homosexuality. <clears throat> The term homo homosocial, sorry, as developed by Sedgwick, describes social bonds between persons of the same sex and is often used to describe activities such as male bonding. The notable way in which Parkins contributes to the queerness here is the way in which James constructs his identity then. To move beyond the idea of oppressed or repressed sexuality is to allow the reading of a socially isolated and academically motivated figure that encounters ghosts through his search for knowledge. Parkins moves in wholly male dominated circles because the sphere in which he moves is a patriarchal, masculine and homo socially driven one. In his quest for knowledge, Parkin shows intellectual arrogance and ignorance. The temptation to try a little amateur research in a department outside his own is just too ir irresistible for him. And it's this unknowing unearthing of ancient threats that are the main ways in which James brings his identity into question, especially compared with the ghosts Parkin summons in doing so. To return to Sedgwick's terminology, it's the juxtaposition of his conservative and solidly defined identity with the fracturing figure of the ghost that creates the eerie and haunting effect and, by extension, queers him. Just as he is rendered an outsider by his social isolation, the ghost he summons works outside the binary and boundaries set by heteronormative society and, as Mark Fisher writes, for James, the outside is always coded as hostile and demonic. The ghost is, of course, jarringly different to the 19th century norm I have previously uh, established. And in some ways, it's literally the archetypical cartoon ghost because it's quite literally an animated sheet, which I think when you first think about it, it doesn't seem like scary, but you'll see in a minute I've put an illustration and um, it's one of the things that freaks me out the most I think. So after blowing the whistle Parkins dreams of a figure that's fleeing and cowering from an at first unknown entity that suddenly comes into vision, a figure in pale fluttering draperies, ill-defined. There was something about its motion which made Parkins very unwilling to see it at close quarters. It would stop, raise arms, bow itself towards the sand, then run stooping across the beach to the water edge and back again, and then rising upright, once more continue its course forward at a speed that was startling and terrifying. On waking up, Parkins then lights the candle by his bedside and quite nonchalantly notes that, oh, this must have startled some creatures of the night, rats or whatnot, which he had scurry across the floor from the side of his bed with much rustling. All in all, there's nothing too sinister in the idea of rats at an old seaside hotel, right? But 
The next night, the haunting worsens. Um, after a day in which the unused bed in his twin room is found in total disarray, and a young boy is frightened, almost senseless, by a white figure waving from Parkin's window, and we reach the final encounter with the ghost that he has unwittingly summoned. Unable to sleep, Parkin suddenly notices that there had been a movement, he was sure, in the empty bed on the opposite side of the room. Before he can really process or explain this away with some logical reason, he sees a figure suddenly sit up in what he had known was an empty bed. The figure is humanoid, or at the very least human sized, and yet it's wrapped in sheets and able to seemingly materialize from nothing. And this is jarringly different to the very human and very immaterial ghost popularized by the 19th century spiritualists. The sheet enclosing it lends it a very real physicality. And this idea heightens its queerness and emphasizes the effect it has on Parkins and by extension, the reader. Parkins feels trapped by the specter. Somehow the idea of getting past it and escaping through the door was intolerable to him. He could not have borne, he didn't know why to touch it. And as for its touching him, he would sooner dash himself through the window than have that happen. After watching the shrouded finger stu figure stubbly, stumble blindly around the room, Parkins finally catches a glimpse of a horrible, an intensely horrible face of crumpled linen. To risk veering into Freudianism, it's the sheer uncanniness of this hum non-human thing having features that are recognisable enough to be understood as a face that causes Parkins to cry out, result resulting in the ghost to physically attack him, thrusting its linen face close to his own and pushing him halfway through the window backwards. It's only the timely intervention of one of Parkin's fellow hotel guests that saves him from the violent and seemingly murderous actions of this very real, very physical, very solid ghost, the attacker. Another story that features a decidedly un-Victorian ghost is The Diary of Mr Pointer, in which an antiquarian named Denton moves into a house with his maiden aunt. After purchasing the diary of a William Pointer, who was another antiquary but from two centuries before, Denton discovers a piece of cloth with a, apartment on it, a pattern on it reminiscent of a knot of curling hair. His aunt is delighted with the pattern and insists upon Denton having a set of curtains made up from an exact replica of this cloth. Once the curtains are set up in Denton's room, among others, the curling pattern is connected in loops at the top of the curtain. This gives Denton an uneasy sense of foreboding and eventually this foreboding comes into fruition when he encounters a strange humanoid being made entirely of human hair in his bedroom from which he barely escapes to the safety of a different room which doesn't have the curtains. This hirsute ghost at the centre of the horror of Mr Pointer is admittedly at least recognisably human in shape um, and in fact, it actually first takes on the guise of something much more domestic and comforting because Denton at first mistakes the spectre for his dog. Then he woke and bethought himself that his brown spaniel, which ordinarily slept in his room, had not come upstairs with him. Then he thought he was mistaken for happening to move his hand, which hung down over the arm of the chair within a few inches of the floor. He felt on the back of it just the slightest touch of a surface of hair. He, of course, has no reason to believe that this is anything other than his dog until the horror unfolds, as what he had been touching rose to meet him. It was in the attitude of one that had crept along the floor on its belly, and it was, so far as could be recollected, a human figure. But the face, which was now rising to within a few inches of his own, no feature was discernible only hair as he bounded from his chair and rushed from the room he heard himself moaning with fear denton is able to discern a human shape in the figure before him but it's this recognizable form in contrast to the horror of its physicality that's both at the heart of the horror and the queering of this entity this ghost made entirely of the hair that actually is at the center of the design on his curtains is at once familiar and alien in shape it's formless and yet it's discernibly human. And through this, James captures what Fisher has categorized as an eerie absence. James's ghosts 
as um, illustrated by Denton's hairy assailant, show both something present where there should be nothing and nothing present where there should be something. Their presence is unexpected, but more than this, their lack of human features and strange, formless yet recognisable shapes reflect a void where we would expect to find conventional attributes of humanity. The strange hairy spectre is also a very real threat to Denton, as in his struggle to escape, he felt a soft ineffectual tearing at his back, which all the same seemed to be growing in power, as if the hand, or whatever worse than a hand was there, was becoming more material as the pursuer's rage was more concentrated. So, combined with the solidity of this being, and the fact that it's both familiar and yet unrecognisable, the very tangible threat it poses to Denton is a world away from the pseudo-benevolent messenger spirits we find in much of the rest of the literature of this period. The ghost that haunts Denton, like all of James's ghosts, is in one way or another queer ghosts, because they do not follow the patterns and expectations found within the popular impression of the ghost from the period. So finally, the most explicit deviations from the Victorian ghostly, ghostly expectations are found, in my opinion, in the ghost stories that feature demonic, primordially medieval entities such as Canon Alberic's scrapbook. There's very little that is recognisably human in the spirits that haunt these stories. In supernatural horror in literature, self-confessed M.R. James fanboy H.P. Lovecraft addressed this directly when he noted that James departed considerably from the conventional Gothic tradition of pale and stately spirits with his lean, dwarfish and hairy ghosts that are often a sluggish, hellish night abomination midway betwixt beast and man. In many ways, their horrific and abhuman nature is amplified by the fact that these ghosts for the most part, appear only briefly during the narrative. This, is, this was noted particularly by J. Randolph Cox, who wrote that James's beings from the beyond are terrifying in their solidity and how through the effect they have on others in their brief appearance, they are more shiver producing than if they were dwelt on at length. So in other words, the ghosts don't manifest in the narrative long enough to allow us to rationalise their appearance or nature. Instead, we see a brief, horrifying glimpse at their strange queerness before the protagonist escapes or is rescued from their clutches. And I think this is another example of Fisher's idea of eerie absence at work, as James's ghosts are more terrifying when the reader is left to fill in the gaps, if you like, and create their own image of them in their subconscious. So... To return to Lovecraft momentarily, the status of the Jamesian ghost as betwixt beast and man means that they embody all of those traits of primitive human beings that are most frightening to the civilised and rational, because they're not merely ignorant, but aggressively violent alongside. As I've previously mentioned, it's this aggressive violence, this tangible, very real and very physical threat that marks the most explicit difference between the Jamesian ghost and the 19th century norm. They bring neither a message nor a passive warning from beyond to the protagonist. Instead, they often seek violent vengeance or act as the murderous guardians of hidden artefacts or secrets. This makes his ghosts much more medieval in nature, I believe, than the airy nimbus spirit of the Victorians or even the modern day, which might materialise, then drift gently towards a door and disperse. Whereas a medieval ghost was more likely to break the door down and beat you to death with the broken planks, which um, I think you'll agree is definitely something I can imagine the Jamesian ghost doing or at least trying to do. And the best example of this kind of medieval ghost can be found, I think, within Canon Alberic's scrapbook where we find English tourist Deniston, who is holidaying in saint bertrand de Comingas in the south of France and buys an unusual manuscript from the cathedral. He later deducts that this belonged to a canon Alberic who, centuries ago, collated a scrapbook of excerpts cut from volumes in the old cathedral library. This includes a woodcut illustration of King Solomon and a demon, the demon itself materialising in the real world in an horrific, tranchy-like form at the story's climax. This spirit is therefore less a shade of the deceased than it is an ancient entity called forth to exact revenge after its medieval manuscript was desecrated by the titular canon, 
James describes the being as uh, one of those awful bird catching spiders of South America translated into human form and endowed with intelligence just less than human. The horrid combination of arachnid and man being emphasized by the mass of coarse matted black hair and a body of fearful thinness, almost a skeleton, but with the muscles standing out like wires. This clearly plays into one of the most common human fears, and M.R. James was himself arachnophobic. And this moves the ghost further away from the normative idea of the passive, familiarly shaped and often benevolent spirit. On the contrary, the strange figure that manifests from page to reality is very real in the danger it poses to Deniston and it attacks him in his lodgings. From these close quarters, Deniston can describe its pale, dusky skin that covered nothing but bones and tendons of appalling strength and a wealth of coarse black hairs, longer than ever grew on a human hand, as the entity reaches out towards him. It stares at him with eyes filled with an intelligence beyond that of a beast, below that of a man, which places this spirit in a liminal space between human and monster, or human and animal, which queers it in comparison to the 19th century norm. The way in which James describes the demonic spirit feels fractured and confusing. It's not quite one thing or another. And this contributes to the threatening, terror inducing atmosphere experienced by both Deniston and the reader. It's fractured due to the contrast between bestial and human traits, along with the supernatural yet solid and real yet unreal nature of the thing. This obviously echoes Sedgwick's theory of constitutive and fracturing natures, with the demons summoned from the pages of the scrapbook thus being a queer form of ghost. So let's bring things to a close because I think I've been talking for much long enough. Um, as I hope I've demonstrated, M.R. James's stories were markedly different from other ghostly works in this period, and this was mostly through his violent, aggressive and tangibly threatening spirits. It was also through his ghosts being, on the whole, unfamiliar and inhuman, as well as solid, and embodying a very real and very physical presence. Yet the Jamesian ghost story is still seen to be the ghost story, and James the writer of ghost stories, despite the obvious contrast between his works and others written in the same period. I've argued this is due to the overwhelmingly psychoanalytical stance usually taken by critics of James. They argue that we can see his own repressed homosexual tendencies within the stories and in the tension and anxiety experienced by his protagonists. However, when we move past this concept, it allows us to instead explore the simultaneously fractured and constitutive identities of both his human protagonists and the ghostly beings that haunt them. To use the definition of queerness that I've established and developed throughout this talk, his ghostly figures are therefore queered due to the establishment of eeriness within his work, mainly because of the absence of human signifiers where there should be some, along with the queer non-normativity of his protagonists and ghosts in comparison to social or normative expectations. Thank you very much.